think more about the uh, uh, anxiety. Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? I didn't hear you. Yeah, tell me a little bit more about what you've been experiencing. Um, so it's, it's really, it's an interesting feeling. It's like, um, it's kind of like a constant thing. It's not really, um, I, it, I, I don't want to say it comes in waves. It does sometimes, but it's more like a perpetual, like restlessness, I guess, where it's like, I can't just settle down, uh, and like focus on something. There's like something for some reason, like something is trying to get the attention of my mind. And it's like, um, it's like telling it like, Oh, here, pay attention to this, like do this. But I, I don't really know what it is. Um, would it you, goes away uh, sometimes. Would you kind of call it something like an alarm bell or like a child tugging on your coat tail or something like that, trying to get your attention? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just be like doing something like reading, uh, I don't know, reading a textbook or something for class and then it'll just be like, oh, like, hold on, there's something going on here, like, pay attention to this. And then it seems like the more I pay attention to it, the worse it gets. Um, so I, I don't want well, like, I'm I don't try to push sure it. I'm sure that's away. true. Maybe the more attention you pay to it, the more attention you're paying to it. Maybe, yeah. Maybe I'm just more aware of it happening mm. at that point. Yeah. So, continue on. I'm interested in what's happening with it. Um, let's see. What, how else would I describe it? Um, I'm not really sure. It it seems to it seems to come up in like a weird way where it'll be like when I'm when I'm like attending to something. Like so, I like I said before, but like. It'll feel like um, like I'm not supposed to be here or something like that. It's like this weird, odd feeling of like <laughs> I'm not supposed to like be in existence or something like that. I, I, I don't know exactly how to describe it. It's like a weird thought that comes to my head and then causes it to like okay. ramp up. Rather than saying you're not supposed to be here, it's that you're either supposed to be someplace else or more likely because you're someplace else you're supposed to be doing something else or that you could do whatever it is that's important to be done here now also mm, right mm -hmm. this is how most people experience um this drive of anxiety within um Within transactional analysis, um, uh, a system of psychotherapy that I got fairly deep into uh, back in the 1970s, they talk about five drivers, and one of the five drivers is hurry up, and that's the one that is most um, often associated with um, anxiety except that Byrne likes to use childlike words. Mm. So hurry up, or that whatever you're doing now, you should stop doing and go hurry up and go do something else. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely feels like that, yeah. All right. Um, where do you most likely find it if if you could find an area or a spot in the body where this anxiety would be located where would it be in the neck and the shoulders or would it be in the chest area in the belly um, you, recently it's been sort of like feeling like around the head I would say like very much like in like the front of like my experience I would say like right around I don't know here like my forehead <clears throat> oh you feel it in the head yeah yeah in the head uh -huh. <laughs> and and how about tightness in the chest I feel that occasionally but it's usually in the head oh 
Okay. And would you call that also tightness? Yeah. 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 It feels like a tightness. Uh-huh. And that so um, the kind of way that the mind processes is, is that whatever it is that the Buddha labels restlessness, that modern psychology labels as uh, anxiety or as um, Mel Brooks <laughs> in his movie Hang Anxiety or in... Um, the TA label of uh, the hurry up. One of the qualities that it has is, is that people, when they have this, this experience or these kind of experiences, they don't like them. Is that correct for you also? I see you already shaking your head. Uh, yeah. I mean, I would say like it used to be worse. Like I used to like it less, I guess I would say. Now I'm kind of like grown more accustomed to it so I can like live with it, but it's, it's disturbing. It's like, uh, it's annoying. I would say it's like, it's like if there's like a fly or something like trying to like, you know, like buzzing around my head, like that's, that's how mm -hmm. I would describe it. Except that before when it was buzzing about your head, it was also screaming in your ear in the sense of, uh, having the feeling that you've got to do something. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, I, <laughs> this is an old situation that's very familiar. And that um, uh, generally the anxiety that was experienced had to do often with motor vehicles or traveling. That that's when I would have uh, the anxiety, especially if I, it was time for me to drive mm. and I had an appointment to go pick someone up or something like that. That's when the anxiety would come. Uh, but I know now where it came from, when it arrived, how I dealt with it, and that um, at the last point, I could see that uh, just as the remnants were there, I could still see how it affected my driving so that I would drive faster than I actually needed to. That it was a conscious effort to drive slower, which when I mean drive slower, I mean slightly faster than normal traffic. To me, that's slow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that comes from uh, let us say, um, not fully recovering from a motorcycle holic. I see. <laughs> and so, um, I know what you're feeling, at least I know the experience of it, and that, uh, so, the way that we can look at it is, is that this anxiety can either come up from the realization or the fact that there is something immediately that needs to be done mm -hmm. that we hurry up and do, or that we get ourselves in a state of anxiety. In other words, for me, driving fast is completely different than having the anxiety that causes me to drive fast that I can drive fast without having that feeling. One of the, by the way, one of the reasons why I like Thailand is because I can drive fast. <laughs> but one of the disadvantages of being on this island, which I'm now on for the past five years, is that there's very little place to go to drive fast. <laughs> <laughs> but... That's one thing uh, of having an immediate task, like going to picking someone up at the port or something like that, versus a generalized anxiety that we're not quite sure of what it is that needs to be done right away. Right. Mine is way more like the second one, right? It's like very generalized. 
I, I have no idea what it wants me to do. Just always there. <laughs> yeah. But but I imagine that you spent uh, quite a lot of time trying to figure out what it is that needed to be done. Yeah, yeah. I'm still trying to figure that out, and I can't. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, now we're getting someplace because this feeling of anxiety is a habit that we pick up from childhood that may, um, let us say, when it arises, it may not have a causal factor that can be easily seen or recognized. And so we talk about it as coming out of the blue or uh, um, in, in regard to we don't know why or how or we don't even know the process of going from zero to 60, how long it took, whether it was like this. But all we know is when I recognize it, it's already going at 60. Yeah. <laughs> and there it is. Okay, so the first part that we can recognize is, is that we can do some breathing. Once you see it, it's, it's almost like, um, let's call it a pet dog who sees danger. And his job is to, to uh, guard the territory. And that... Uh, the problem is, is that he's just barking a little bit too much. And that as we uh, train the dog, any barking that he does winds up being too much. But in the beginning, it's just simply overload. And that the way that we can uh, handle that is by reassuring the dog. Down boy. Pat it on the head. Uh, uh, Tell the dog that everything is okay, that that stranger, even if there's a stranger in the yard, it's okay for that stranger to be there, okay? Um, and the reason that I'm putting it like that is because, oh gosh, there's a whole long list. One is dog is man's best friend. If you can be kind to a dog, you can be kind to yourself, even though you're barking on the inside too much. Uh, another one is, is that the dog is coming out of pure instinct to do that, that they have physical territories to where humans, our territorial system has gotten all fudged up because of all the migration that we've done so that our territory winds up being not so much of a physical territory like your yard at home. So you can still see that kind of boundary exists. But mostly the human mind's boundaries are on of ideas, concepts, ways of looking at things. The Buddha calls it view, a nest of view. And that uh, it can be possible that something happened that stepped on one of the twigs of this nest of views. And that's when it springs into action. And we don't even know what it was. Uh, but you can by beginning to reflect, to beginning to notice what it is that's causing this. As you're beginning to catch it quicker and quicker, that means you're closer and closer to the source of how this stuff got started. For the dog, it's fairly easy. I don't know every time the dogs bark, but generally I know why they bark before they bark because I've tuned myself to be here in the present moment. Another uh, one is, is that whenever Tam comes around the corner, I'll know it with even not even the, uh, the headlight showing that I can tell there's something about it that when we, when we attune to something that you begin to pick up on it in a fairly excellent way. And so um, doing that on the outside is the same as doing it on the inside. That in fact, the inside and the outside kind of merge and become kind of one. It's the big it, where everything is complex. But uh, you can 
talk about it like being on your toes or being uh, uh, on guard. Now, that's the one that I like, is being on guard. But we could be on guard in a normal way or we could be on guard in an exalted way or let us say a high class or a high quality way so that we're in a state of deep satisfaction. And when that anxiety then comes, we can actually treat it as if it were a puppy and pat it on the head and say, down boy. That's kind of hard to do when we're in an ordinary state of mind. But part of the practice of meditation of Anapanasati is to bring the mind up into a high quality state. This is, uh, we can refer to this as uh, the, the word first jhana, mm-hmm. or you can look at it the way Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa talks about it, and that is to have a mind fit for work. Or we can look at Anapanasati, and we can see right there in the way that Anapanasati is put together that is designed specifically to put one in the first jhana. And that the skills that we need are the skills of the Eightfold Noble Path and the skills of the Anapanasati Sutta to bring us into a state of mind that is superior to our normal state of mind. And um, we can refer to that in many ways. One of them would be to be here now, to be really present in this present moment. And that that's um, quite a lot to um, uh, to talk about in the sense of what are the goals of meditation. You could say that that would be one of the goals, but that goal is also going to be in the service of another goal. And that another goal is going to be to deal with that anxiety as if it's just like a barking dog that you can tame and quiet and settle down, down boy, down boy, all right? And that part of that has to require the quality of getting the right air to breathe. So Anapanasati says, take a deep breath to breathe into it, to let yourself know that you recognize that the anxiety is there. And uh, also we begin to inspect why it's there. What was the causal situation that brought it up? If you don't see it immediately, that's all right. It may, in fact, come to you within the next couple of breaths. But you can begin to find what is the trigger for that. It, it can be even going back to the, uh, the triggering of uh, anxiety in association with driving. Getting into the truck is the causal thing, and then bang, and it's there. And so that means that whenever I... For me, it seems like... Sorry. Sorry. (laughs) I think you cut out. Can you repeat what you were saying? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um... Yeah, so for me, it seems like it just arises, and then and then my mind finds a reason, uh, like afterwards, and says, "Oh, well, this is that this is, is so why." Typical. That is so typical. But normally, the reason for it is a job to be done. And what we're looking at is uh, thanks for asking this question, because we're not looking for what the uh, anxiety is is there for to do or mm-hmm. what its purpose is or the message that it's trying to give you. I'm looking instead for the causal agent. Okay. What was it that triggered the anxiety? Not what its message is. Okay. We're looking for the arisal of the messenger, not the message. 
I see. Okay. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That, that, that's a very subtle difference. And this yeah. is what we're looking at. We're looking for where does this stuff come from? And that you can begin to see that. Right now, you, you, you can't because you never even was looking for it before. Right. But you can also understand quite easily from the, from the, um, uh, the phrase that they use, cause and effect, causality, or conditionality. The Buddha was really big on conditionality or causality. Uh, a lot of different words were used in the uh, in the Pali. One was idiopapajayata, right. and another one is uh, paticca samupada. Mm -hmm. Okay, Depend dependent origination is looking at it as uh, the cause and effect. Now, the the thing that's kind of interesting is is that the this cause was immediately and we don't even know how fast this immediate is an effect in fact you can see that in some cases the cause and the effect touch each other and overlap so during one part of the process this thing that has now um uh been affected by something in is acting in that effect causes something else to happen now, you can understand that at a high level from dominoes. But you can also see it from the situation of forest fire. And they spread like that. Sure. Okay. Uh, or the conditionalities of, of sometimes rain and weather. But we can also at least conceptualize it right down to the molecular mone level, down at the level of molecule. That they just everything is in flux, everything is in constant flux, right. uh, and so um, what the human mind is trying to do is make sense out of the world we're not really truth speaking machines what we are is pattern matching machines and what that means is is that we're trying to take points of reference out of a very complex environment and connect the dots together so that we can get from from here to there we can get a little understanding but the understanding that we need basically has some very, very deep drives. And the deepest one of them all is the drive to, for survival, to stay alive. And there has been absolutely zero animals, humans, mechanisms, worms, insects, none of us have ever been successful <laughs> at survival. That's true. True. <laughs> and so when we recognize that this issue of the survival instinct is actually deeply buried right into our DNA, as well as a causal or a driving agent, and that the primary value that uh, this uh, preservation instinct has is alerting us to danger. And that one of the mechanisms of communicating danger is through fear, but you can also see that anxiety is related to fear. Mm -hmm. But in fact, in another culture, or in a uh, different language, you just simply say that I become stricken with fear for no reason at all. And people would understand that, but you're using the word anxiety, but you can see the relationship. Right. And, and that uh, to further that, we can add in words like restlessness. Mm -hmm. 
which means that we're not comfortable, we're not settled, we're not secure and safe where we are, that the restlessness means that we got to go check out the territory, we got to go be on guard, and this kind of stuff. All right, so, but at this level, it's, it's instinctual. What we're actually going to start doing is doing it consciously as well, because it's already operating in instinctual mode, but by doing it consciously, that means that now we're alert to it. Now we've woken up. Now Stati has brought us into the here now so that we now can inspect it rather than having this old system that keeps bringing up fear Mm -hmm. for literally no purpose that we know of. But something is triggering it. And for some people, it's just there seemingly all the time that anything that happens will happen will trigger that anxiety. This happens especially to young boys about the age starting at 14 to 15. Mm. If you remember that time, you'll remember that uh, anything that anybody said to you was an embarrassment. Ah, so you know that feeling. Guess yeah. what? <laughs> what you're experiencing now is very similar, if not exactly the same thing. And we just don't get out of it. We get into ourselves into a state of anxiety when all of those new hormones are flowing and whatnot. And then it's hard to get out of that anxiety. Yeah. Because we're not aware of it. But now you're going to start becoming aware of the causal factors. In other words, what we're doing now today is in the beginning what we were doing was we were just beginning to recognize it and start to breathe and do some things like that. But now we're going to go one step backwards in time back to what was the trigger? What started this stuff? Okay. This is exactly the way that Paticca Samuppada is taught in the sense that it's taught in forward order. That this happens, consciousness happens, and then perception happens, and then an internal representation happens, and that's what contacts us, and then feelings arise, etc. like that. So by the time that anxiety is there, there is also the accompanied feelings of that anxiety as well as the fact that you don't like it. Mm-hmm. Right. And so beginning to bring, bring it forward in time or sooner in time, just a split second or so, a beginning to check on uh, things to become more alert or more aware, or bring your sati up just a fraction of a second sooner is what we're looking at. So that you can begin to see this stuff as it arises and begin to get an idea of what was it that caused it. Now, there's another uh, excellent point about this. Now that we're speeding up the process or beginning to see it a little bit earlier, we're also monitoring it or checking it when it's not as strong Mm -hmm. that in fact we're beginning to watch it at when it's at a weaker level this makes it actually easier to deal with but there unfortunately is a catch-22 in this and that is the first noble truth this is seeing dukkha this is your dukkha right (laughs) Okay. Uh, at all times, right? <laughs> right, all right. And that the first noble truth is for us to get fully in touch with suffering. That it is, after all, a full noble truth all on its own. It's not something in passing. It's something that we've got to really, really get in touch with. Mm-hmm. Except that what you're talking about is getting in touch with some icky stuff, which we don't like to do. Yeah. <laughs> and so that first noble truth is kind of hard in a way. Um, Jesus had a saying, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. It has a third line to it. 
Ye shall know the truth. The truth shall set you free, but first it'll piss you off. Right, yeah, you mentioned that last time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah okay. So now we're going to be even more quick to get it, which means we're going to be seeing it actually more often. Because if it only comes up to a certain level, and before our uh, threshold was up here, then we have anxiety that we don't even notice. That that was something in the beginning that you were thinking that this anxiety that you experienced is new. But now for sure you're convinced, oh no, it's been there all along. I've just been driven by it without even being aware of it. Yeah, there were definitely patterns of anxious thought before. And uh, it's, it seems that now it's just become like 10 or like 100 times more intense and just like right in my face. But it's not more intense. It's just that you're closer to it. Yeah, I, I, I guess that's true. I guess that's true. Yeah, it's, it's, not like, it's not like extremely intense. At sometimes it is, but it's more like a low level, like just very aware of it. All right. You, you are familiar with the concept of the, the term or, uh, that I use when I say the square of the distance. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's used in E equals MC square. It's used in Newton's formula for gravity. The distance has a quality to it. We know that for sure with, with uh, music or with sound that... Um, with with trains and Doppler effects and all of that kind of stuff, that as the train is coming for you, when it get while well, when you get right to it, it's making its most noise, and as it recedes in front of you, the horn of the train then loses its volume. The same thing with headphones, because of the nature of the headphones, you can move it just that far, and you can't hear the headphone anymore. Right. So uh, this is also a way of looking at it is that you're actually getting close to it. It's not so much that the anxiety is bigger than it used to be. It's that you're closer to it. You're on top of it. Right. And so uh, that's part of the, the catch 22 is the, the, the more dukkha that you investigate, the more of it you're going to find. And that sounds almost counterproductive. It looks like that we should be able to get it out and then it's yes. gone, but oh no, it keeps coming back. But now we're getting really expert at seeing it coming back. And so we see a whole lot more of it. Yeah. yeah. Here's an example of this. This is well known within the Goanka community that on the first day that students will be able to catch the mind wandering away from the breath four, five, six times, seven times. But mm -hmm. by day six of the retreat, it's, uh, they're catching the mind wandering away from the breath 30, 40, 50 times. Okay. If that's the case, then is the mind wandering away from the breath uh, uh, the process or the skill, is it being developed or no? Because now we see it all the time wandering away. It's always wandering away. But before it was only wandering away occasionally. Does that mean that we're getting worse or does it mean that we're actually in, in the beginning of the retreat, the mind would wander away and it'd be taking a long time to catch it. Right, yeah. Now uh, on day six... Yeah. We're catching it really quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's also the phenomena that you'll begin to work with. Is, is that, And not only that, but here's now the key. And that is, is that instead of not liking that it's there, you're going to start liking that you could catch it so often. Okay. This is actually in Anapanasati, step 10 of Anapanasati. When I say steps, I'm not talking about marching steps, but rather much more like dance moves <laughs> <laughs> where you're all over the place, okay? So step 10 of Anapanasati is to gladden the mind at that point of contact when you recognize 
that the mind has wandered away from the breath. Now, that point of recognize that the mind has wandered away from the breath is actually the point then that we add for everything in life, including that point in time when you wake up to anxiety or that point in time when you uh, see that the thoughts that you were having were not wholesome thoughts. But this is always the point of sati. And that sati is best then followed by gladdening the mind. How do you how do you actually do that? Like, what's the process for, like, after you've noted it, like, what do you do to gladden the mind? Okay, with the anxiety, we say, oh, I see you. Okay. Uh huh. I see you. You give it recognition. And then you take a deep breath into it, and you really like that deep breath. Because you know that, that that deep breath that you're taking is very beneficial to the body-mind complex. Okay. okay. So you uh, that gladdening the mind has many things that you can do. We can even go so far as to call it affirmations. Mm. But the affirmation is not like, my, what a good boy am I. Oh, I got a really high test score at that particular time, but rather right now. How can I feel really good right now? The answer to that is by gladdening the mind, then the feelings will come along. Okay. And we'll talk about that a little bit more next time. Sure. Just introduce Sanapanasati a little bit gradually. But basically, we start with Sati, that wake up. And your job right now with, uh, with the anxiety as well as all of your practice of meditation is to have that that sati develop to the point that it happens more often and it happens quicker in a process okay okay so that's sati development and with that sati then the next and by the way sati is normally associated with step nine of anapanasati because step nine is experiencing the mind and that's exactly what we do when we wake up. We experience what's in the mind right now. Are we watching the breath or not? Or are we having anxiety or not? Or whatever is going on that we begin to experience the mind. And the more often we wake, we wake up with sati, then the more often we have an ex, a chance to examine the mind, to experience the mind. And as we do that, we gladden the mind to bring it out of the ordinary state that it was in and get it ready then to start working with feelings. So now we've got the breath. This is actually what we mean by the Satipatthana, is, is that you recognize that there was hindrance in the mind, in your case, anxiety. So we're working with the fourth tetrad of the Dhammanupasana. And then you wake up to it, sati, that's step nine. You gladden the, uh, the mind, that's step ten. Now, this word sita in the word sita nupasana is actually not so much of the frontal cortex as it is to recognize it from the anterior cortex or the reptilian brain or more of the dog brain. Because you know that, that uh, even um, alligators, Everything that an alligator can do, you can do also with that reptilian part of your brain. Which means that we're, what we're really going to do now is to wake up this frontal cortex, the more human part, so that we can really begin to see what's going on in relationship to this reptilian brain that for most people runs their lives. All right. But what we're going to do is we're going to wake up to be human we're going to wake up to be an adult knowing that anxiety is coming out of the id or out of the child or out of the um instinctual part mm. of the mind and that it's in the habit of doing that and so as you begin to spark things uh as that sparks off and you begin to recognize you might wind up coming back to me saying, wow, I had this really intense insight into blah, 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 blah. <laughs> because that's what, because when you're really looking, 
you begin to find things. Okay. So this is what we would say for today is now that you've gotten a handle on getting hold of this um, anxiety, now you're going to spend even more time intensely to be happy that you can find it and to start actively looking for it. Okay. And to always keep taking a deep breath over and over <laughs> again. Make sure that you remember this is sati and that this is actually more useful We'll talk about sitting versus uh, living, but right now this is a living issue for you. And so you mm -hmm. should practice it uh, while you're out living as opposed to seclusion on, on, the, uh, uh, on the cushion or whatever. Okay. Uh, okay. So practice this throughout the day. Uh, those, those times when you knew that it would be coming, you know those already in advance. One is going into class and having to sit. Yeah. <laughs> okay, another one is walking to class and other things like that. So you begin to start connecting these dots of when does this stuff come up? What's its patterns? What are the things that trigger it all? And always remember to breathe. Keep breathing. <laughs> to break it up. Sounds good. Excellent. All right. <laughs> Do you have any questions about this? Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe it's probably like for further, further along the path. But, um, like, are the like super mundane like attainments supposed to like prevent these kinds of feelings from like arising completely? Or yes. Like In fact, you're doing the super mundane right now because you're beginning to deal with them. So finding them is super mundane. Seeing them in depth is super mundane. Being free from them is super mundane. Okay. Putting up with it and saying, poor me. Is not. <laughs> is not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Sounds good. All right. Excellent. Okay. We'll see Thank you later then. Thank you.